This is the Alpha Lift Street Fighter Alpha 3 podcast with your hosts, Beth Weston, Luke and Fitz. It's showtime! Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Alpha Lips podcast. Uh, if you couldn't tell, that was my homage to the famous video introduction of today's guest. Now, this man needs no introduction, but I'll provide one anyway by reading a brief excerpt from his Twitter description. 68K YT, as in YouTube subs, experienced pro wrestling villain, British retro gaming god, delightfully devilish. And nothing could sum it up better. Um, and it's an absolute honor and privilege to welcome Richard, the creator of Top Hat Gaming Man, to the show. Now, over to you, the quest to start the interview. Thanks, Luke. Welcome to the podcast, Richard. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. And thanks for waking up early to come on. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. 11 o'clock, been up. I've got a son um, who's um, 19 months old, so I've already been up about five hours by this point anyway. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> not on the true game, my timetable anymore. No, sadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like growing up, what was the first console you had? Oh, that's an interesting question because I was actually um, gaming um, pre-console era in yeah. Europe back in oh. the days where um, people were predominantly gaming on microcomputers. Mm-hmm. So yep. um, I, I had an Amstrad CPC 464, mm-hmm. which I inherited from my uncle. I believe he gave it to me when I was three years old. In terms of consoles, though, um, the first one I had in my house, I was my uncle's again, a very big um, gaming influence in my life. Um, it was a Super Nintendo. So Super Nintendo is what I started out on. Did you um, have a favorite game on the SNES? In the early days, it was it happened to be Street Fighter 2, strangely enough. Wow. Um, yeah. When I was really young, uh, I must have been about, I don't know, six or seven years old, um, he never used to actually let me play on the Super Nintendo. I used to just have to sit in his bedroom mm. watching him play, like fantasizing about having to go on this <laughs> sitting, game. It's sitting like, in no, your uncle's bedroom fantasizing. It's a bit of a weird scenario. But I would be desperate to get my hands on this console, and he would always be like, it's too expensive, you're not allowed it. Wow. However, yeah. um, there was an event that occurred that changed all of that. And that was when I started going around to one of my school friends' houses, um, playing a Sega Mega Drive, playing Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, the dark and, side. Yeah. So then I went home to my mother and was like, wow, my my, um, my friend's got this amazing computer, because we just called them computers at the time, and he's got these great games like Sonic and Streets of Rage, so I really want one. So um, my uncle was a little bit more tech savvy than my mother, so um, she went to my uncle should i get him a mega drive it's like no don't get him that, that that's old ta- <laughs> you want to get him a super nintendo here he can borrow mine so yeah. from there i ended up borrowing his and i believe i had a copy of street fighter 2 on there um super mario world and um star wing which is obviously star fox to mm. some parts of the world and i absolutely fell in love with the system and gaming in general up until mm. this day so yeah. in your early days of playing street fighter did you have like a like friends or a brother to play against Strangely enough, because um, my uncle, there was only a 12-year age gap between us, um, I would right. play with him a lot. And I remember getting really, in, getting particularly angry with me at points where we didn't really know what we was doing, but I would like block him in the corner. He was like, stop blocking me in the corner, that's <laughs> cheating, and stuff like that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, did you play the Alpha games um, when you were a kid, or did you only play them recently? Alpha- What's my story with Alpha? I first remember coming across it. We had a popular magazine in this country called Nintendo Magazine System, which I guess (laughs) would be the equivalent of um, Nintendo Power Magazine. It was the official Nintendo Mag in this country. Nintendo um, Magazine System. Yeah, it was called Nintendo Magazine System. Interesting name. (laughs) I believe it transformed its name in later years and became known as Nintendo, just Nintendo official magazine. Okay, There's right, Nintendo yeah. magazine system in the early days. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why I first remember seeing the Alpha, um, Alpha 2, actually, I believe, because that mm-hmm. came out on yep. Super Nintendo in the later years. Um, I think I first probably played it on either the Sega Saturn or Sony PlayStation. Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure. Um, but I've, now I've got multiple copies. Like I've got a box copy on the Super Nintendo. I've played it against, uh, I've played it across different platforms. And uh, one story um, I was telling um, Quest actually mm-hmm. uh, prior to this podcast was over in the United States. I attended an arcade convention in 2011, oh, yeah. and I was having 
um, some fun playing the um, Alpha 3 cabinet they had there. Mm. And um, there was like a 12 or 13 year old lad who came mm. up to me and noticed I was playing so badly. He felt the need <laughs> to show me um, how to perform certain moves and stuff. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that's an interesting um, link. Like, I feel like most of us are coming from the more kind of competitive street fighter oh, yeah, side. Definitely. So oh, it's really. It, sorry, you go. I'm just saying that I've noticed from many of the comments I receive in my comment section that is definitely a big yeah. demographic of viewers. Yeah, so it's really it's really interesting and refreshing to see videos from more of the casual perspective of what people think about Street Fighter. Um, we'll get into your third strike video particularly a bit later because that's um, yeah a lot of a lot of ground to cover there. Well, we but we came um, into into contact with you after you used some footage from our YouTube channel. Yeah. Did what did you and, what did you think of the channel and was there any footage that stood out to you as a casual player? Um well for me um, the reason why I selected footage from your channel because it was one of the only ones I could find with um footage of uh, the characters who got included in was it one of the later iterations yeah. of the game so I believe Max, it was Thee Long yeah. yep. the Super yep. Street Fighter one so mm -hmm. um Thee Long um T-Hawk etc DJ Yep yep so that was that's what drew me to your footage was you was the only people I could find who had caught decent footage of those characters in action. Yeah, okay, and you, who, and you specifically wanted those upper and max sort of extra characters in your yeah in your exactly yeah yeah I needed yeah, I a good um, source. The yeah. guy who made that footage is extremely proud of the fact that he's got some of the only footage out there of certain combos with those characters and he's a real like fanboy of that um, specific version of the game. So he'll be very happy to hear you say that. That's that's amazing because, <laughs> like I said, I, I don't consider myself um, a good enough player of mm -hmm. the games to be able to use my own footage when it comes to um, Street Fighter titles. Mm -hmm. I'm more into, um, like I said, the history of it and the legacy mm -hmm. and the overall impact it's had on the gaming industry as a whole. Yeah. yeah. So on the topic of Alpha 3 Max, I heard that you plan on making a video covering it. Is that true? Yeah, like my, my long term goal is to pretty much make a standalone video on every single um, entry in the wow. Street Fighter series and maybe even long term the majority of fighting games. <laughs> yeah, um, by, by, <laughs> sorry, by every awesome. entry, do you also mean iteration? Like, are you going to do the Game yes. Boy one? Yes, yeah, that's, that's, you've got to watch the channel more, Quest. No, I, do, I do, but for, right? for, Alpha, for Alpha 3 Max specifically, because I know they've got a Game Boy version, they've got a PSP version, they've got yeah, the PSP. All, these, all these different ones. And that was that was it to me. I felt that the, the, the Max and the PSP version, um, where the PSP version and the GBA version of those games were too different to the versions that have come before it to just whack it all into one video. I yeah. felt that the handheld entries need separate videos down the line. Oh, yeah. I, look for, I look forward to those. You mentioned in your Alpha 3 vid that you prefer Alpha 3 to Alpha 2. Like, What are the things yes. you liked about 3 more? Um, for me, uh, it's just the huge um, roster selection you've got in Alpha 3. The fact that you've got all of the lovable characters from uh, the Street mm. Fighter 2 series, all, all the 17 of the main ones, and then you've got a load of other characters on top of that as well. Um, for, for me, um, coming in as such a big Street Fighter 2 fan, to have all of those characters, plus a load more, um, I just thought that was great. So you, I, I saw in one of your videos you describe yourself as a lifetime collector, and you kind of mentioned it then. Yeah. Like, how did, how did you kind of transition from a kid, you know, interested in gaming that, you know, many people are to like a serious collector? It kind of happened organically. Um, mm. So I was always into collecting things. Again, I had a lot of influence on my uncle thinking about it. Like, mm. because he was only 12 years older than me, I would get a lot of his old hand-me-down, hand-me-down mm. yeah. sometimes. Like, I got his um, childhood Star Wars toys from 1977. Ah, wow, yep. That could be worth a lot these days, right? <laughs> yeah, and um, even as a nine-year-old, I remember um, watching the Antiques Roadshow and another child had brought in his Star Wars collection. <laughs> and that, yeah. that, that really impressed me. So it made me look at all the ones I already had. And from there, at nine years old, I ended up heading out to um, the boot sales and collecting more Star Wars figures I didn't have. And mm. then you had, um, in 97, I believe, they re-released the original Star Wars trilogies, like director's cuts in the cinemas. Yep. So that made Star Wars mainstream again. Mm. So um, I, I got really into that. As the years went on, um, they became rarer and they just slowly uh, began to dry up. So I was just mm -hmm. still going to boot sales and finding other things that interested me. I, I've noticed that all the old Sega Mega Drive games, this was by the early 2000s we're going into now, the Sega Mega Drive games 
and the Master System games were all like 50p to one pound each. And as I explained mm-hmm. to you earlier in the show, um, the Mega Drive was always a system I wanted as a child, but mm-hmm. never had yeah. because I went for the Super Nintendo. But mm-hmm. suddenly I could have a Mega Drive as well and buy all the games for like dirt cheap. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it happened. It happened organically just by going to boot sales and I built up a big collection and I've yeah. just had a lot of fun with it over the years. What's your what's the um, most prized item in your collection or like the one that means the most to you? Oh, um, I'm going to bring up two here. Mm-hmm. There's two games that mean a lot uh, specifically to me. First is the PAL. I've got a PAL boxed copy of Mega mm-hmm. Man X3 for the Super oh, wow. Nintendo. Okay. Yep. And basically, um, the Mega Man series has always traditionally performed very badly sales-wise in Europe. Because really? I, yeah. I believe it got a foothold. It's probably the same in Australia, actually. It mm-hmm. got a foothold in the market on the Nintendo Entertainment System in the mm-hmm. U.S., yeah. And obviously, the Nintendo Entertainment System was really only mega popular in the United States and Japan. Mm. So yeah. Mega Man never had an opportunity to organically grow. So I had a lot of fun as a child playing Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo and Mega Man X2. And Mega Man X3 was one of the system's late releases. So it was made mm. in extremely limited quantity in, in a, a region where it already wasn't popular. Yeah, so yeah. it was a game I always looked for. And about 20 years after its release, I ended up paying quite a large some yeah. of money to add it to the collection because I just wanted it so badly. Mm. And the other game I'd like to bring up is um, I've got a boxed American copy of Earthbound. Oh, um, wow. That's that's yeah. pretty rare, isn't it? Like, yeah. Well, it's often brought up as a rare one. Yeah. And the reason why that one means uh, particularly a lot to me is because I actually purchased that one um, from my biggest wrestling payday. So uh, uh-huh. I had. I had a short yeah. stint working for a company called TNA Wrestling in yeah, America. Yeah. Impact really? Wrestling. Oh, I used to be a big Impact fan of um, TNA. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy. You, so what, you wrestled with TNA? I had a really short contract with them in their prime wow. um, on a show they were running called um, TNA British Boot Camp Season 2. They yeah, pretty okay. much... Mate, do you remember WWF Tough Enough in like 2001? Yes, yes, I remember. Did it, um, they, Rockstar Spud or somebody win yeah, that? Yeah, Rock, Rockstar Spud won <laughs> season one of uh, British Boot Camp. I was in season two and was one of the 16 finalists. Oh, nice. So, what was so that, that like? It was, it was surreal because I took up wrestling as a hobby uh, whilst I was at university in 2007. <laughs> um, and this was in a time period where um, smaller guys, like I'm only five foot ten, um, mm-hmm. didn't really go anywhere especially if he was from the uk like anyone who'd been exported from the uk previously like uh, the british bulldog or william yeah. regal for example a giant so as um, a small british wrestler i never foresaw myself doing anything of impact to excuse the pun yeah. <laughs> so um, to do that it, it was great and um, in some ways it's i'm a bit um, regretful that I didn't pursue wrestling more seriously when I was younger to be in even better condition um, when I did all that because obviously I never foresaw a time where um, smaller wrestlers would be more valued like they are today. Yeah, so, um, I was competing in a land of giants um, in the what, early days. What was your kind of that. persona as a wrestler? Like you said before, or in that introduction that I read out, said that you were like a villain kind of archetype. Like, is that was that what you were on the show? You can look it in. You can look it up on YouTube. There's old matches. Um, oh, I wrestled yeah. the persona of um, Richard Parliament, and okay. pretty much <laughs> Richard, yep. Richard Parliament was um, a politician, but the character and the top hat gaming man are one of the same. They even dress really? the same. Oh, yeah. So it was a kind concept. of a, a really smooth. It was. It was a crossover show. It's a smooth transition. And yeah. in 2016, I was um, wrestling really regularly and running the YouTube channel side by side simultaneously. So it's kind of like a wrestling side project. Did you have a favourite like UK wrestler? Uh, I was always a big fan of um, William Regal growing up, so I definitely took some influence from him. Yeah, same. I like his um, villain role that he played. Yeah, so I'm, I guess he got some of that that villainous kind of um, you know above everyone else sort of character. Yeah, the snobbery, and I thought the yeah. snobbery as well transitioned perfectly into the channel in the early days. Uh, because like again like the fighting game community which we can get onto a little later uh, yeah. the collecting community retro game collecting community can be very elitist so mm. um, i thought it was quite amusing to parody such a character of that like, had, this elitist collector have you kind of had people um misinterpret your videos as not being in character like i feel like if you watch one or two it 
you may think that that's your actual persona. Like, have, has there kind of been some blurring of the lines there that you've found in comments or things like that? A hundred percent, especially in the early days, because um, mm. I was very much because, like I said, I started wrestling training in 2007. Mm. So um, I was very much of the old school kayfabe uh, yeah. mindset yep. where you never break character. Yeah. So even back, if I had have done this interview with you four years ago, the whole thing would have been in character. Yeah. So there's definitely some blurring of the lines. Yep. No, yeah. That's really interesting. What motivated you to start a retro gaming channel? Um, partially down to the fact that I already had um, a large game collection and knowledge base. So I had I'd always watched um, a lot of retro gaming content as well. So um i'd in, enjoyed like the majority of people people like the angry video game nerd um yep. game sack gaming historian a lot of the big american channels mm -hmm. um so i did notice that there was less of a british perspective at the time so i wanted to bring a british perspective to the table and i also wanted to find an additional one an additional purpose for this large collection i've built up and yep. secondly to that by by 2016 i was 30 years old so I was um, starting to become slightly worried about um, getting injured in a wrestling match yeah, and yeah. then not having anything to fall back on, really, at least hobby wise. So I wanted to find fun doing something else. And YouTube just happened to be that that thing I found. So your safe fallback job was to become a YouTuber. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> say it was a fallback job. It was a fallback <laughs> hobby. Yeah, so okay, I, right, yeah. Well, yeah, because basically wrestling I always worked a full-time job alongside wrestling. Yeah. Okay, so right. I wanted YouTube to become my next hobby, if that makes yep. sense. And it's just grown bigger than that. Yep. Yeah. On, on what you were saying about the um, kind of American bias, I saw in one of your videos as well that you mentioned, um, you felt like some of the micro computers, you know, like you mentioned the Amstrad, but also the ZX Spectrum and like yep. stuff like that were, were quite underrepresented. Like, do you feel like that's still the case or yeah. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? I don't feel it's anywhere near as much as the case as it was um, when I started four years ago. There's quite a few um, British retro gaming channels continuing to grow and grow. I've got a lot of friends who are just really growing these days. I say yeah. Guru Larry's approaching 400,000, Nostalgia Nerd, 400,000, and Nostalgia Nerd pre wow. predominantly covers They're micro computers. You've you got to catch up. Yeah, I have. These guys started <laughs> a couple of years before me, but yeah, I do want to catch them up. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, yeah, I've got there's there's a lot of big um, British channels around at the moment, so that gap is is closing. I feel mm -hmm. with microcomputers being underrepresented. Yeah, I've noticed the British flag in the background in some of your vids. Like you got a pillow with it in, in your channel that has a British flag. Are you a patriotic sort of person, or is it just part of the character of Top Hat? I'd say a bit of both with that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. This is Future Luke. I just want to apologise for the clicking that you're about to hear. That was me, kind of tapping on the table um it's there for a little bit it's a bit annoying but it'll go away uh, back to the podcast look i want to get into some of the youtube game so I, I really admire your youtube craft so some of your titles are amazing so one of my favorites the mad his and the caps are very important the mad history of x-men versus street fighter and why it outraged people exclamation mark question mark <laughs> rare gaming history that, that's just clickbait gold and also you're very good with the um with the thumbnails you know the titles the kind of social media like how what what's your thought process with that kind of stuff is that an important part of your your channel um one second so i can hear clicking is that me or you oh that might be me sorry <laughs> okay so, <laughs> no, no worries <laughs> um yeah um the aim is generally when i come up with a video first of all i think of a game i want to cover yep. but apart from that then i have to find a good hook to go mm. alongside it. Yeah. So um, I research the game and then I find what's perhaps the most interesting element of the game or something what people might not necessarily know about. So with um, the X-Men versus Street Fighter game, for example, the main hook I found was um, the disappointment um, with the PlayStation conversion of the game. Yeah, okay. So that's, yeah, so that's pretty much how that works. Mm -hmm. yep. And then do you make all the thumbnails and like, posted and everything you don't have some like a social media manager or something like that no i do i literally do everything everything myself yeah oh classic <laughs> classic youtube yeah um, but i want to get into maybe my favorite video of yours so a bit of context on this we we mainly play alpha 3 and street fighter 2 and we have a bit of a kind of 
healthy rivalry with the third strike players in Australia. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think we're, we've definitely got a common enemy there. Well, maybe not enemy, but <laughs> yeah. you made a you made a forty minute video called "The Mad <laughs> Story of Street Fighter 3 and it's delusional, toxic fandom, <laughs> rare gaming history. So I love yeah. that title. Um, <laughs> And I, I got some quotes from it just for people who haven't seen it. Some people love this game so much that they simply refuse to accept facts that the game was not as popular as others. This is the sort of idiocy I deal with sometimes. Um, do, you have, do you have anything to say to the Australian Third Strike community that, that might be listening to this? Um, <laughs> I think like any community, like I said, you've got, you've got the elitist, elitists there. Mm. And um, again, people who refuse to accept facts. Um, Street Fighter 3, as great as the series is, it did at the time um, not sell very well in comparison to Street Fighter 2 yeah, previously. Yeah. So, um, and the mass market appeal on the game is seriously lacking. Like by the time Street Fighter 4 came out, um, a lot of people was like, "What about Street Fighter 3? I don't ever recall there being a Street Fighter 3. Do they yeah. mean Street Fighter Alpha 3?" Yeah, so yeah. that confused a lot of people. So the whole point was when I made the original Street Fighter 3 video, not the one about the fandom, when I made the original Street Fighter 3 video, mm -hmm. the whole video was about why do the mainstream market, sorry, why aren't the mainstream market aware of Street Fighter 3 and why was it so overlooked at the time? And mm -hmm. there were so many different reasons why that happened to be the case. Um, but then that video obviously seemed to outrage a lot of people because they'd never seen someone upload a video on um, Street Fighter 3 before in a negative context, if that makes yeah. sense. Even yeah. though there was yeah. nothing negative about the game, it was all yeah. more about the negative marketing of the game and the appeal. Mm. Yep, yep, I um, Might not be remembering correctly, but we had a conversation before about your um, auntie and uncle. Did they own a pub yes. and they had arcade yes. games? What was that like? So my mother had a brother and a sister. Um, mm. The brother was the uncle I was talking about before, and she also had a sister. Who yep. And her and her husband in the 90s were pub landlords. So okay. um, they, yep. they would and run land, pubs. Land, land lady, landlord and lady. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they would normally have an arcade cabinet in the pub. Yep. And the majority of that time, because obviously this was the early 90s, would be a Street Fighter 2 cabinet. So... Mm. Um, Obviously, of course, it's our... so much more popular than Third Strike, as everybody knows. Oh, yeah. I, I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen a, a Street Fighter 3 cabinet in this country, ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, the Street Fighter 2 cabinet, I would actually get to play like after hours when the pub was closed and before it was opened and stuff, which I always thought was really cool. We'd just be able to sit in a pub alone playing Street Fighter 2 in its yeah. heyday. That's oh, nice. Right. Cool. Did they get you, like, free food and drinks and stuff? <laughs> um, they they were landlords, but on the basis that they never actually owned the pubs they they um, they run. So they would manage pubs on behalf of corporate chains. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. I wouldn't actually get any freebies there, sadly. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, you're currently showing beat 'em up games. Are there any in yes. particular you're looking forward to covering? Um, I feel like I'm slowly getting through the majority of the ones I was really keen to cover. So I'm looking forward to switching paradigms with mm. regards to that soon. But ones I'm still really keen to cover, which I've not got to yet, but I will do very shortly, is uh, the Simpsons arcade game. I'm very keen to make a video on that. And more yeah. importantly, um, the 8-bit um, home computer ports, which people <laughs> don't seem to know exist because apparently it, um, Simpsons was always a game what was locked to the arcades, which simply isn't true. It just was not on the um, Super Nintendo or Mega Drive, but it was on home computers. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Wow. Um, so that was and, an officially licensed, like, yeah. Port, like I, I didn't, yeah. yeah. You're correct the, that nobody knows about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a couple of different ports of that I want to cover. Yeah. Wow. And I, I'm keen to start getting through uh, the Double Dragon series as well, actually, because I've oh, not yeah. even touched that properly yet. So those are some yeah. big ones I want to do. What are you going to do if you run out of fighting games or beat-em-ups? Is that possible that you can get through every single game? A fighting games, I think it's going to be very difficult. And if I wanted to stay um, doing fighting games after I've covered every game, which I can't see happening anyway, I could start doing um, more history on mm. the actual fighting game community, or I could start doing lore videos on like individual characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or perhaps when you finish like covering all the games, the new games now will be retro games by then. And you'll yeah, have more yeah. than cover. Absolutely correct. <laughs> We've also got, with terms in terms of the beat-em-ups as well, I, I do want to drift away from them soon because, like I said, I feel like 
I've nearly covered all the ones I, I'd like to cover and I'd like to move on to other genres like run and gun, platforming, stuff like that. So yeah. I like to go really deep on particular subjects because then it becomes really easy to compare and contrast one game against the other, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yep. Yep. How do you play so, these games? Do you do you play them on like arcade emulators and that type of thing? Or? Um, I've got a Raspberry Pi and that's generally how I tend to play a lot okay. of emulators. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You said you had an in-person encounter before, like with someone that was a 12-year-old 12, 12 and they'll, they'll try <laughs> yeah. to tell you how to play the game. Have you had a yeah. in-person encounter with like a competitive retro player that's a bit older? And... Um, Has it ever happened? Not, like... <laughs> no, not really, to be fair. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to older people, it's generally um, yeah. on the keyboard rather than in person, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, because uh, yeah, these days, yeah, it would be on the, the keyboard. Have you had people like stop you on the street and recognize you <laughs> on the channel? The weirdest one, actually, I, I believe it's only happened once away from conventions, and it was actually in your country over in Australia. Really? Yeah, yeah that, that freaked me out. Um, basically, um, I was on a long walk through, where was it? Oh, God. I don't know. It was in Sydney, in some yeah. quite hipstery sort of district. Okay, Newtown or something? I think it was Newtown, yeah. Yeah. That's and, where all uh, the hipsters that play retro arcades and stuff would live, with beards and, like, man buns and stuff. Yeah, exactly one of those sort of areas. And yeah. uh, my, my, we was going past the coffee shop and my wife was desperate to go to the toilet. So we went in this coffee shop and we got inside and there was loads of retro arcade cabinets everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. I, I just ordered a drink whilst my wife went to the toilet and the man yeah. by the car was like, wow, you, you're the top back game. <laughs> <man."> <laughs> That's awesome. And I was like, wow, yeah, yeah, I am. And this was, bear in mind, I was in Australia three years ago. So I only had... 6,000 subscribers. So that made it even <laughs> more baffling. Yeah, well, and, people um, Australia have fine taste in YouTubers, obviously. Yeah. But it turned out what made it even stranger was that apart from that he, he, apart from the fact that he knew who I was, he also had a mutual friend um, yeah. of mine who, who I knew from wrestling. One of my wrestling opponents was his friend in real life. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's really odd going to the complete opposite side of the planet to find yeah. someone who watched my YouTube channel and had mutual friends yeah, randomly. Yeah. So, what are yeah. some of your, your favourite conventions that you've been to? Um, I do, basically, that there's this convention um, in England known as Play Expos, and they run like Blackpool, Manchester, um, London, and mm. um, Margate and a few other areas, and I tend to do panels these days at most of theirs, so I really enjoy their ones. Yeah, that'd be fun meeting all the fans. Um, yeah, it's quality. And I get to meet and yeah. work with other YouTubers as well, which is always fun. Oh, that's mm. good. Yeah, collaborating. Like you're collaborating yeah. with us today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you having a lot of fun? Yeah, it's great. It's good. <laughs> Especially during lockdown where I don't get to see people. Yeah, yeah true. You're going to get a huge subscriber bump from this. There's probably at least you know, 10 or 15 sold listeners of this podcast. Oh, that'd be um, awesome. And so, um, you know. basic, I will post this video as well in, um, what's it called? In my, I'll put it in the community section or something. Oh, so cool. you should get some yeah. uh, kickback from this, I hope. Yeah, that'd, yeah, be, that'd, that'd be awesome. Um, more people looking at Alpha 3 would be great. And obviously listening to our beautiful voices. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you said you traveled around the world and you did yeah. some gaming. Was it for gaming or was it just to travel? Um, basically, this all goes back to when I was 30 again. I, I mentioned I wanted to change um, elements of my life. So um, that it was the same year I started the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And um, I was due a, um, basically, where you update your mortgage on your house. And mm -hmm. uh, where it had gone up in value, um, I noticed that I could take out a chunk of money. Um, at first, I wanted to buy an additional property to rent out. But then the UK brought in some stupid law where you have to pay really high taxes and stamp duty if you own more than one property. So yeah, I, th okay. I thought that idea is out the window, but I've always wanted to travel. Mm. So I thought now is as good as any, really, to take the opportunity. Yep. So I uh, took out some, some money from my property and um, went traveling for a year. So went to went to Australia for a month. Mm -hmm. um, did the US for three months, uh, visit mm -hmm. 25 different states. Wow, that's um, intense. Spent a month up in Canada, a mm -hmm. um, couple of months over in Greece, um, Hungary? a month in, month in Cambodia, a month in Thailand. Um, now, later on, since I've become a, a full time YouTuber and I'm working on a laptop all the time, 
mm. that's when I've been able to visit other countries. So Hungary, prior to yeah. lockdown, that's where I was spending some time. Because now, yeah, obviously, yeah. I'm, I'm working online permanently. Um, I don't need one solid base. So that's why I can I can travel when I like now. There's the that's perks amazing. of being a YouTuber. Yeah. So that is that that's presumably where you filmed the handhelds around the world series. That's um, yeah. That's where it started on that trip. Where how did I, f- I find that a really interesting series in that it kind of combines it's it's like a travel cooking show but it's like a travel gaming show, um, <laughs> like yeah that I, I really like that format. Are you going to continue to do handhelds around the world or kind of what's the status of that um that series? Uh, so yeah, basically when I was in Hungary, I I shot loads of footage. So I've actually got um three more episodes um, yeah, right. already made ready to upload to the channel, mm-hmm. and um, when lockdown ends. I hope to continue to do um, trips, filming mm. more episodes in different countries. So, yeah. yeah, it's definitely a big part of the channel. And again, it's something what came apart circumstantially at first, where I was doing the, the gaming reviews mm. on my channel in 2016. And then six months into my channel's lifespan, that was when I went away. So I needed to think of something new, what mm. let me carry on doing what I was doing. And that was yeah. handhelds around the world. Yeah, that's amazing. When did when did it start to take off? Like, what was the moment when you're like, wow, this is actually starting to get a bit of a following, or, um, yeah, really get some traction? Um, there's this breakthrough moments, I suppose. Like 2016, uh, the first year I did it, I don't think there was really any particular moment where it really broke out. I think I finished the first year on like 2,500 subscribers. It took okay. eight months to get the first 1,000. I yeah. remember that, and then. It was the second year um, when I started covering, um, doing like in-depth retrospectives of different pieces of hardware. Mm-hmm. So it was a yep. hardware video is what really first started getting views. So yep. when I was, on, especially when I was covering more ex- obscure systems, like making half-hour videos <laughs> on platforms like the, the Panasonic 3DO and stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah, so stuff that people would be searching for that they would not be covered in detail anywhere else, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of why the fighting game series has worked really well, because you've got lots of fighting game videos out there focusing on uh, the community aspect. But Mm. there's not many out there focusing on like the commercial aspect of like the game's commercial successes, Mm. their impact on the mass markets and um, stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that's why the Third Strike video like annoyed so many people is that in the Street Fighter community, like people that still play the classic games, it's it's up there as probably the most played or second most played of the like real retro street fighter games. So people just, it's antithetical to their worldview to see that, you know, amongst the more casual players, it wasn't kind of the biggest game ever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really yeah. interesting seeing that split between the FGC as it's known and the, um, you know, the rest of the world. It's kind of like how earthbound would be to like a um, hardcore Nintendo fan compared yeah. to, a member of the casual market, I suppose. Yep, yep. That's your first video on your channel, right? Earthbound. Yeah, yeah. And that was partially because I was I was so proud of owning that copy, which I bought yeah. using my TNA money. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's a tax um, it's a tax write off. If you use it in a video, it's tax deductible. <laughs> that, yeah, it is these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, interesting. One one of the secrets of YouTube, I guess. What is the most challenging part of making content? um what's the most challenging part it it does vary really previously it was um i'm trying to think it it, it is at at different times there's different challenges so uh what would be the biggest challenge at the moment is that's a difficult question because i I just feel really positive and upbeat at present so i actually i'm struggling to even think of a challenge (laughs) yes But there are definitely a lot of challenges. I'd say the, the, the biggest challenges are in the early days when you're trying to get that ball rolling. And the longer you're generally making videos, mm-hmm. um, the easier it is to create content that gets hits. I'd say one of the hardest parts I find, well, what I scrutinize myself the most with these days, is when I make thumbnails for videos. Sometimes mm-hmm. I end up spending as much time um, making a thumbnail as I will do actually writing the script. Yeah. So, I really scrutinize the thumbnails because that's obviously the first thing people see Mm. and make make a snap decision whether they're going to want to watch a video or not. So I'm going to say thumbnails. Okay. Yeah, good answer. Some YouTubers say the search algorithm is working against them 
or they are being unfairly demonetized. Do you have any criticisms of working with YouTube or anything they could do better as a content creator? They could do more to, um, I'd say, to tweak their algorithm to further favor um, evergreen um, content, what's got um, long-term value, if that makes Mm. sense. For example, I make videos which people can watch on the day they're released and then a few months later, they'd be just as relevant or hopefully even years later, mm-hmm. whereas other people will get just as many views just uploading a video um, on a new Nintendo Switch game being announced today and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas those videos hold no long term value. They're valuable for one day. Yeah. So and then they I make one the very... next week about the launch trailer and then one the next week. Yeah. about blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So those mean. videos become worthless very quickly. So if I feel any criticism of YouTube, they should do more to promote content of permanent value, if that makes sense. Mm. I feel yeah. like people have started gaming that. Like you see it with a lot of the podcasts now that like, you know, obviously the biggest one is Joe Rogan, but everyone else is kind of following that model of you record some three hour long podcast, chop it up into 10 minute bits and then record them, you know, upload them like one a day kind of for weeks. And they somehow kind of, get picked up in the algorithm and like recommended to people at the same level as like very um you know in-depth like high production value videos yeah. like yours yeah. so you know they're both 10 minutes but one of them took 10 minutes to make and one of them took a week to make like there is definitely a, a difficulty there i reckon as well yeah i've noticed there does seem to be some sort of algorithmic shift at the moment i don't know whether it's actually the algorithm itself or whether it's lockdown that's changing people's viewing habits mm, wow, but I've no, yeah. yeah it is I've, re- I've got to be really analytical with all of this because obviously it's my full-time <laughs> living yeah um, okay. but i've noticed at the moment when i'm tending to upload videos they're getting less immediate hits than they were before but mm. they are being viewed over a longer period of time and um, mm, my overall okay. watch minutes are at an all-time high which suggests that at the moment more of my older videos are being watched than they were before. So maybe mm. they have changed something internally in YouTube. Or like I said, maybe it could be the pandemic was changing people as a whole. I don't really know. Yeah. But it's, this is all stuff to like scrutinize. Yeah, it's interesting. Yep. What do you think of Vimeo and Daily Motion and those other sort of sites? Um, sadly, I don't think any at any point, anytime soon, anyone's going to be able to catch up with YouTube. Yeah. It's so embedded as uh, the popular video platform for like independent um creation that no one's going to catch up sadly yep. so it'd, it'd be lovely if youtube did have competitors but it's just so hard at this point it would be like a social media platform trying to rise up and um beat mm-hmm. facebook it would yep. be like yeah. myspace trying to beat facebook or something like that it's just people are very embedded in what they watch yeah yep. well face- facebook defeated myspace so it's possible but yeah it looks unlikely at this point yeah, but it, with, yeah, with distraction for so long, yeah, like I said, it would be difficult. Yeah. Before this podcast, I spoke to you about your top hat, and you said your original top hat, you actually gave it away to somebody. What was the yeah. story behind that? Mm, wow. Um, yeah, basically a friend of mine ran um, a charity um, prize draw. So mm. he, he found a load of um, YouTubers with subscriber bases and um, asked them if they would donate this and they would donate that. Um, so he just asked me if I would, was willing to donate um, a top hat. I think it was for the charity Mind, I think, mm-hmm. uh, Mental Health. So I literally gave him the top hat and um, someone won it in a prize draw. So I wow. lucky them. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. What did they, were they a fan of yours already? Or? Yeah, strangely enough, um, a, a gentleman um, who lives in Florida won it, um, Sebastian, and he's actually a Patreon, patron of mine as oh, well. Wow, so, yeah, amazing. luckily, yeah. someone did win it who was a fan. Yep. Yeah. I have a quote from one of your videos, Beyond the Hat. You said, okay. I think the gameplay, <laughs> like in relation to retro games, you said, I think the gameplay is marginally better than the majority of games that come out today. What are the things you like about retro games that are done better than modern games? The the pick up and play nature is the primary difference maker, in my opinion. The fact that you could before just plug these games in and straight away start having fun. Whereas the way they seem to be engineered these days, before you can even play the game, you often have to sit through hours of time wasting and tutorial Mm. to even be able to start sinking your teeth in. Um, Developers these days expect you to invest a hell of a lot of time 
into a game before you get anywhere. Um, and that's it's been that way for quite some time. Like um, during lockdown, for example, at the moment, I've been playing um, Persona 4. Not exactly a modern game, but it's it's modern to me. It's about 12 yeah. years old. Um, <laughs> and so far, I've spent like 55 hours on that game. And wow. I think it was about it took about 10 hours before I started getting anything out of it. So for me, that was the difference with retro games. Like if you play something like Mega Man X, one of my all time favorite games, um, if you play the opening stage of that game, um, the game's intuitive enough for it to teach you how to play as you go along rather than um, bombarding and the same would go with something like street fighter 2 rather than bombarding you with uh, walls upon walls of text and explanation on how to play a game i just yeah. feel like they were engineered better many old games for simplicity um less is more that's a good way of putting it yeah it's really interesting i heard i heard a theory about why that's the case that currently developers um like can't make enough money off just the initial point of sale but they also have to make money from dlc and like trying to convince people to like um do micro transactions and stuff so they want people to keep playing their game as long as possible it's not just like a one one buy you know as soon as you've sold the 50 dollars or 25 pence not pence pounds well um, yeah that's the games it, you know. today are, yeah the games are getting bigger and bigger each yeah. day so um obviously the bigger they get um, the production costs are continuing to go up but yeah. if the bizarre thing is if you go to a shop today and you buy a brand new game, you're mm -hmm. paying less for it than I would have been um, going to Electronic Boutique in mm -hmm. 1992 and buying a game, which yeah. is just ridiculous considering yeah. the production cost differences. Yeah, the th thousands of people working on it, whereas some yeah. of the credits for Street Fighter 2 has like eight people on it. Like, exactly. It's, a joke. Yeah. it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and that they created a game, as you say, that's so easy to pick up, but has depth such that people are still playing it, you know, 25, 30 years later. Oh yeah, one one other thing I was going to bring up. I saw so you mentioned that it's kind of is it it's basically a full time job for net, for you now YouTube is that correct? Yep, that's correct. I noticed you're you're getting into the merch game, so kind of just about yeah, bit of a that, bit of a budding Jake Paul or um <laughs> you know one of these guys. So you you got shirts, jumpers, singlets, bags. Yeah. <laughs> what what's next in the top hat gaming man line? Maybe top hats. Um, I've had a lot of um, pressure from my audience. I think that's because they would think it'd be funny. Um, they want yeah. um, top. They want top hat gaming underwear. So I might look into that <laughs> down the line. Wow. Okay. I <laughs> and another thing, this is that kind of um, that kind of entertainer. <laughs> <laughs> Something else I would like to produce as well. I just I don't know whether I'd, that's because I think it'd be funny, but it's retro, and I think people might want it. I'm tempted to sell um, top hat gaming man VHS tapes. So oh, episodes yes. on VHS. I think that'd be quite amusing. Yeah, the full Streets of Rage saga on a two VHS um, yeah. <laughs> collection. That'd be awesome. For your next um, Beyond the Hat episode, do you have any ideas at the moment what you want to do for it? Because I found that pretty interesting to watch. Beyond the Hat was a strange one. I made that, um, when did I produce that? About four months ago. And sadly, um, like looking at the watch retention mm. and um, the, the overall views, it, it wasn't as popular as anything else I was producing, which I was putting down to the fact that um, if someone subscribes to a channel, they usually subscribe for very specific content. So the documentary style content. So um, I axed Beyond the Hat pretty quickly because I wasn't sure what it was doing to my channel, but I am about to bring it back on the basis that now my YouTube channel is heavily Patreon funded. So yep. I'm going to make it a Patreon only show um, for the people over on that platform. Mm. Yeah, That's that makes cool. sense. Is there any extra things that the Patreon people get? Uh, yeah, they get, they get. well, I like to think I give them quite a lot of stuff. Um, they get episodes of Handhelds Around the World um, one month before anyone else. Mm. Um, they get all of the content um, advertisement free. Mm -hmm. um, they get all the videos at least um, one day uh, before everyone else. Um, access to my um, Patreon Discord. And um, they also vote on the majority of my uploads now so most of the videos i've been putting out at the moment have been chosen by the patrons oh, nice. wow. okay. what was your most requested um, upload um i'm going to click my channel quickly that's and then okay. i will know yeah like, what got the most votes youtube probably videos. third strike <laughs> oh video. it was um yep. turtles, <laughs> turtles tournament fighters oh <laughs> really Man, yeah, a lot of people that's got a huge following that. I never yeah, and actually, it's, it's, it's 
also in the last couple of months it's been my most viewed video 65,000 views in it's three weeks so what oh, i gotta get i gotta i'm not i'm not hip to this i gotta um gotta find out about this game <laughs> it's a street fighter 2 clone basically with the turtles yeah okay no. and it's three three different versions of it which will play quite differently i've got i got one more question unless we've got some more quests what like what do you think is the fascination with retro gaming? Like, how, what do you put that down to? It seems like it's really big in just the cultural milieu at the moment that lots of people are into retro games. Like, do you think it's the nostalgia factor or? The mainstream seem to put it down to nostalgia because um, in their mind, if it's old, um, mm. it's got to be nostalgia. People are just um, wanting to play these old games um, to remember mm. a different time. But um, personally, I think that's potentially wrong maybe if you're somebody who's going to go out there and buy a super nintendo um mini classic edition or something like that and just yeah. uh buy it for the sake of it and just play the games once then yeah you're bu probably buying it for nostalgia yeah. but people like myself who have wars and wars of games i yeah. like i said i think it's mostly down to um the paradigm shift that's happened in gaming over the years where you're getting such mm. a different experience from these older games than newer games like I find myself often playing um, old games I've never played before. So that's certainly not nostalgia because mm, they're new yeah. experiences. I'm going to play um, games of that archetype, if that makes sense. And I think mm -hmm. it's people wanting something more simple. In fact, I could bring this back round to um, Street Fighter 3 again. Mm. Yeah. Um, or what, what was that game? What was it called? Street um, Capcom Fighting Evolution? Yeah, um, the one that no one really nobody played. <laughs> yeah, it was by that point um, that Capcom basically pretty much pulled the plug on fighting games and just thought mm. these these are old hat. People aren't interested in them anymore. Yeah. Until but Street was... Fighter 4 famously kind of re ah, yeah. re reinvigorated the, the market. Yeah, but the actual reinvigoration just started just before that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and the reinvigoration started with a re-release of Street Fighter 2 on the Xbox um, mm. Live Arcade. It performed um, way better than Capcom expected. And because of how popular that was, that's what got um, Inafune um, clamoring um, for Capcom to produce um, Street Fighter 4. And so basically, um, Street Fighter 2, it saved the arcade industry um, back yep. in 1991. <laughs> and then in like the mid 2000s, the second coming. The yeah, it saved the fighting game industry. So it saved two industries in two different decades. Like that's a special game. So my last question is, who is your favourite Alpha 3 character? Alpha 3 character? Um, across all the games, I've always had, for some reason, a soft spot for Bison. Uh, perhaps okay. because he was the final boss in the original versions of Street Fighter 2. Mm. So as a that child, villain, I always looked at him as the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm drawn to villains. <laughs> yeah. Do you think um, Top Hat is more evil than Bison? Or do you think Bison is more evil than Top Hat? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question probably make a good team <laughs> yeah true cool we might wrap it up there thanks again for coming on we really appreciate it yeah that was a good fun chat i enjoyed that cool signing off <laughs>